I, to tell you the truth, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I have a strong personal connection to Canada, uh, not just because of having been a member, a fellow at uh, the Canadian Institute of, of, for uh, Advanced Research for five years, <clears throat> but also my wife is Canadian, or rather Quebecois, and, uh, and so we have a really, for us, Canada is a centerpiece of our personal lives as well. Um, this meeting, I think, is really quite extraordinary to bring together uh, all the heads of most of the heads of the higher education institutions in Canada, together with the uh, Israeli presidents and officials, as well as German. I think it's incredibly important in the world we live in to not so much learn from each other, I don't believe in, in that term in this context, but be exposed, have a dialogue, see what works and doesn't work in other countries, not to try to replicate, that, that would be a huge mistake, but rather to understand the complexities of the issues that we are all facing together in this dynamic world. You heard in the last two days, uh, three, four of our presidents uh, from Israel describing what they are doing in their own institutions. Actually, I learn a lot. You know, I'm supposed to know, uh, but then I budget them. But, some, <laughs> but somehow um, it's much easier to meet in Ottawa than to meet in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. And uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I must say I was impressed. I may reconsider in the budgeting. <laughs> um, and also from the officials that they had the technology transfer offices in some of our universities. And so you had the opportunity to zoom in into these institutions. What I intend to do is to rise above and uh, at 10,000 feet or so, not 30,000, that's too high, I have vertigo, but rather to try to uh, portray an overall picture of, the, of innovation in Israel, the ecosystem that generates it, and the role of universities uh, in that uh, context. So, first of all, um, you know, the, in terms of what I intend to discuss, the first will be uh, a, a, a sort of facts about innovation in Israel, then I would like to focus on a few of what I consider to be the key, the key ingredients that have led us to earn the nickname, if you wish, of the startup nation. And finally, I would like to reflect with you on uh, this ecosystem and uh, the implications for the future. So in terms of the, the, the bare facts, indeed, Israel is an extraordinarily dynamic uh, platform for innovation. And we see it in everywhere. We see it in the, in the numbers. We see it in the people. We see it in what gets published in the media. Uh, we see it, of course, in the economy, given that the high-tech sector has been the engine of growth for Israel for the past two decades and more. You know, the, the, the engine is this about 3,000 high-tech companies. When I say high-tech companies, don't picture, you know, kind of big entities, but rather small, medium-sized st uh, startups, okay, that are proliferating all the time. And we have about, at any point in time, 3,000 of them, which is a lot. Um, we see that, of course, in the activities of venture capital, patents, and so forth. But don't be mistaken, because sometimes we, you may think that there is a, a lot I do about nothing. I mean, it's no, there are some key world-class innovations that have taken place in Israel, and that our lives have changed because of that. And there, these are some of the few of them. ICQ is the precursor of all social media. And it was founded in 1996. And in Israel, it was really a landmark because it signified, signified that, yes, this little country can do something which is of worldwide 
importance. Um, the sun disk, you know, the, 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 we all carry uh, the disk on key in our pockets. I do, at least. And we have taken it for granted. This is also an Israeli innovation that at the time was regarded as, well, it's not clear where it's going to take off, and now we take it for granted, you know, 20 something years later. Dripping in agriculture has changed, particularly, of course, in arid areas. You know, the way agriculture is practiced has increased the performance, the, the, the output, the, the productivity in agriculture by many folds. Okay, this is uh, an Israeli innovation. And by the way, they still hold uh, a big chunk of the market all over the world. And it's improving all the time with new technologies and so forth. Digital printing, again, something that is kind of taken as a given, was also originated in, in Israel and you know, then sold to HP. And there are a vast number of others. So keep in mind, we have lots of small innovations, lots of activity, but also big innovations that make a difference. Now, when you look at the, at the numbers, Behind that activity, of course, there is a great deal of R&D being done. Israel has maintained for something like 15 years, if no more than that, because I can't remember the numbers prior to that, the lead worldwide in terms of the ratio of R&D expenditures to GDP. Now, you may think that that's the government doing it. It's not. Over 70% of R&D is private, commercial. It's not the government that is pushing those numbers, okay? And, and, and the lead is very significant. You know, the countries that come after us, Finland, Sweden, are the Nordic countries that are known for their R&D uh, efforts. Uh, and then the rest, notice Germany and uh, Canada. I will be showing each time the numbers for these three countries, given that we are sitting here uh, uh, together. In terms of patents, um, when you normalize by population, uh, again, ISA is very high. When you look at patents in the US, then I didn't bring the slide, but you know, ISA is doing even better than that. Okay, number of patents taken in the US patent system by Israeli inventors, normalized by population. We, when the last time I checked was a couple of years ago, we used to be number three in the world. Um, I mentioned before the startups. Yes, every year new companies are born and also lots of companies die. And the, and the second part, the dying part, is as important as the first part because that's the nature of the business. This is a risky, by definition, these are risky enterprises and you need to be able to cope with failure. And in Israel, when you fail, that doesn't carry at all a stigma. No, it means that you tried, okay, and now you are, you are ready for the next stage, for the next enterprise, for the next uh, innovation. And look at the numbers. There's a lot of churn out going on year after year. And that's the true engine of uh, what uh, the startup nation. Many of our startups, when successful, are sold to US companies, European companies that came, that come to Israel looking for ideas, technologies, patents, uh, and so forth. Some others go and do IPOs in the US, uh, aside from the US itself, when you look at foreign countries doing IPOs in NASDAQ, Israel is number one, followed by uh, Canada. By the way, this phenomenon of selling uh, to foreign companies is much debated in Israel because it would seem that we are giving away uh, what could have resulted in local growth uh, because we want to speed out and you know, cash in and so forth, and I will come back uh, uh, to this point. So what are the ingredients of what may be called the Israeli Silicon 
miracle of all that tremendous uh, innovative uh, activity. Well, you know, you can come up with, you know, any number of items. And indeed, uh, last night we heard uh, your presentation. There were six elements, if I remember correctly, and so forth. So you, you, one can organize it different ways. But I think that there are three I want to focus on. One, naturally, is the role of universities. I have to confess that if I were giving this talk in a different uh, hall and to a different audience, I don't, I'm not sure I will order it that way, <laughs> but I'm too honest for my own good. Um, so the role of universities, entrepreneurship, and <clears throat> government support. So let, let me go through them uh, in, in a more precise way. When we talk about the role of universities, what do we mean uh, by that? First of all, just the plain old role of training the workforce, the youngsters that will go out and do these innovations. I mean, they need the skills, they need the exposure to ideas, they need the scientific background to do that. And they are uni <coughs> Israel universities, <coughs> sorry, are doing a very good job at that. Not all of them. I don't want them to walk away from here feeling too good about themselves. That's not uh, healthy. But they're doing a, quite a good job uh, at that. But then there is also the scientific strength of them. And let me, for a moment, say, uh, elaborate on that. You need the scientific, the pursuit of scientific excellence, not just because some of these developments, technological developments, are based on the science, but because pursuing scientific excellence, what it does, it sets standards. You have to aim for the best. And doing that, it's hard, as it's hard to do scientific breakthroughs, okay? You have to be criticized, you have to expose yourself to failure, okay? You have all the time to ask the hard questions and so forth and so on. So it's not just the fact that you have in publications in nature or in science, okay, that does it in terms of generating innovations in your students. But the fact that in order to have the publication in nature and in science, you have to set up standards of excellence, of behavior, of determination, and so forth and so on. Let's not forget that, because it's very easy to look at the numbers and think that that's automatic, you know, if just, if only we had another 10 publications in nature, everything will be fine. The other thing that universities do, of course, <clears throat> is they innovate themselves. And we heard that, and I'm not going to spell it out more, but you know, they, it happens in their own labs, okay, the, the people from the technology transfer offices, uh, they do the the, the transfer itself, if possible, and so forth and so on. We know that, I'm not going to elaborate. And then there is collaboration with the industry per se, oftentimes uh, induced, supported by the government because we have to recognize that these are two different cultures, the academia and the industry, and it doesn't come easy to collaborate you know, there is mutual suspicion, you need incentives, okay, you need to prompt them to meet, you know, it was kind of like matchmaking in the old times. Um, so that's kind of about the universities. Now, um, in terms of entrepreneurship and venture capital, I'm going to elaborate in a moment and also about government uh, uh, support. What I want to say at this stage is that these are three necessary but not sufficient conditions. We never know what sufficient conditions are, and we have to be modest and admit that, but we need this. If one of these is absent, the third one, by the way, is not obvious a necessary condition. It's a necessary condition in particular circumstances, particularly so in small countries, Okay, because the process of innovation and R&D entails what we economists call 
market failures. And when there are market failures, it's exactly where the government has to step in and fill the void, okay? So there is a, even if you, as I myself, support the idea of the market and market forces and so forth, there is a definite role for the government to intervene in this realm because the markets not always do the job, okay? There are market failures. So these are three, uh, um, you know, ingredients. Now, let's look at some of the numbers. This is a figure uh, produced by the World Economic Forum uh, in the horizontal index is in the index of innovation and in the vertical one, equality of scientific research. What's important about, gra about this graph is first of all, the shape of it, okay? There's a positive association between quality of scientific research and innovation, okay? And it shouldn't be a surprise, I mentioned that before, but when you see it, you know, when you see it, that countries line up like that, it gives you a more support for that idea, and Israel is high up. <clears throat> when you look at the patents filed by researchers in universities, we see that Israel is a complete outlier. This is a normalized, okay, it's published by the OECD, it's an index normalized relative to the median values in the OECD, okay? So what means 200 is that Israel is twice as high as the median in the OECD, okay? And again, you see the numbers for Canada and, and, and Germany. Indeed, Israeli universities or researchers at universities are known for many years, way before the Bay Dole Act of 1980 and 1984, when in the US, you know, that opened the, the floodgates to patent at universities way before that. Scientists at Israeli universities were patenting, and it was not considered to be something of a lesser uh, importance that you don't do, okay, you do it. Um, when you look at the university industry collaboration, again, there is a strong and positive association between uh, University in this collaboration and the level of innovation, again, is something that should give us pause. Collaboration is not something nice to have, but rather that it goes together if you want kind of, you know, the forces of innovation to be uh, unleashed. I said that the second element is entrepreneurship and, of course, and, and, and risk capital that goes into, into that. Let me, before I go into that, let me say the following. Now, we have the tendency, for good reasons, to concentrate on things that can be measured, that for which we can produce statistics. Entrepreneurship is something that is very hard to measure, to quantify. But you know, as the old saying attributed to Einstein says, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Okay, and this applies clearly uh, 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 in this case. So what do we mean by entrepreneurship in the case of Israel? Well, there's no question that our young people, they have a, an enormous amount of creativity and of daring. You know, the attitude, yes, I can do it. And it's amazing to watch that. You know, when we grow older and we see our own children, going through that phase, and you know, there's, this, there's an expression in Hebrew, uh, you may have heard it, chutzpah, chutzpah in Hebrew, which is, you know, you have the nerve. Yeah, you have the nerve to say, hey, you know, daddy, I came up with something that will destroy Microsoft. I said, what, are you crazy? I mean, what is, well, you know, I mean, uh, he, yeah, he's crazy. But, <laughs> but believe me that that attitude is incredibly important because it means that the sky is the limit. There is nothing interfering between your imagination, your determination, your creativity, your ingenuity, and achieving great things. Um, our youngsters are very comfortable in the international arena. They, they are known to travel abroad a lot, as Canadians do, and often you know, there are some places in the world that the only people you meet are either Israelis or Canadians or Australians. And that's it, you know, I mean, 
And you know, the people indigenous to those areas, they think that that's the world, in the world they speak two languages, English, sometimes three, English, Hebrew, and French. That's it, you know, because these are the, 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 the ones that come. Now, where does that, those attributes and attitudes come from? I wouldn't dare to say that I know. Uh, it's like asking what's in the potion of Asterix, if you know Asterix. I don't know, but it gives him strength. <laughs> now, there are elements that we can point out at. Yes, multiculturalism that you also experience helps a lot. And it helps because we think differently when we see different people approaching the same issue from different angles. And this happens when you go to ask for coffee as much as when you go about solving a problem in physics. So multiculturalism is an enormous asset. And you should feel proud of the fact that Canada has made culturalism uh, one of its leading mottos. And it helps. It's not just its first and foremost a normative statement, but it also helps. There is a competitive culture that is very much ingrained in, in, in Israel. There are the challenges from the military service. Now, let me say a word about that. Some of you may know there is a unit in the army uh, in intelligence that is signal intelligence, SIGINT. It's called in, in the jargon of the army, signal intelligence. It's the equivalent of a national uh, 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 security agency in the US. In Israel, it goes by the code of A200. Doesn't matter, it's a huge unit now. And what happens there is something almost miraculous. I mean, you know, these 18 years old, they go there, they are carefully selected in high school for their intelligence and skills and so forth. They go there and essentially what happens inside, for most of them, not all of them, it's like if you know they, they, they arrive at Disneyland. I mean, they are given all these toys, you know, computers and so forth, but contrary to Disneyland, they're given responsibility. And they say, hey, you, you know, we want to know what the hell is happening with Al-Qaeda in such a place. Go find out. You are 18 years old. How? You find out. You are given responsibility, a sense of mission, toys to play with, and use your imagination, your ingenuity, and so forth. Uh, it's extraordinary what happens to them. You know, I, again, it's our own experiences. I saw that in my daughter, I mean, my elder daughter. I mean, she was transformed in half a year. I mean, it was a different person. And, you know, they, they walk out from there and they set up companies because they come up with ideas. They have a sense of empowerment. There are challenges to be met and they can do it because they have done it for things of life and death. So, you know, I don't wish on any country to have to send the talented youngsters to see Gint. I would prefer that we send them to academia at the age of 18. But at the same time, this is an experiment that allows us, an unwitting experiment that allows us to understand some, the importance of these ingredients. Now, our youth, our youngsters, have all these attributes, but on the other hand, they are very impatient. They don't have business acumen. You know, they are not good businessmen. You know, it's, it's quite unbelievable, but that's true. Uh, their managerial skills are good up to a point, and so forth. So a lot of what we see happening in the sense of selling off you know, these uh, startups and so forth is due to that, that sense of impatience, the fact that when the company gets to be too big for them, which may be a hundred workers, you know, that's it, you know, it's too much for me, I want to do something else, I want to do the next uh, uh, innovation. Now, uh, in terms of venture capital that goes with the entrepreneurship, you need that. You need the institutions that will supply the seed money, the risky money, okay, and uh, in a systematic way to fuel this 
kind of innovative uh, uh, drive, and Israel is uh, essentially uh, number one uh, in the world in terms of venture capital as a percentage of GDP. The third element is the government policies. Now, let me do a bit of history here because it's interesting. Israel, in its first uh, 20 years, grew at a tremendous pace. It was at the time, you know, you're too young to remember. I don't remember it. I just read it. Uh, that there were two miracles uh, that happened. One was Israel, the other was Japan. In terms of the rate of growth, okay, in those years in the 50s and 60s. But then, you know, in the early 70s, the question was, where do we go from here? Well, the economy started to slow down the pace of growth. And essentially, there was a realization that Israel lacking natural resources, okay, the only thing the country had was talented people with a very, with an outsized uh, scientific component because, you know, the, the, the good science that was, was being done in Israel preceded the creation of the state. The Weizmann Institute was created in the 30s, and uh, you know the Technion in, in 1923, and the Hebrew University in 1925, from German Jews that came from the tradition of academy in Germany, and so forth. So we had academia before we had the country. And so you know, the, the question was, what do we do next? And a decision was made to set up what was called at the time a science based industry. The term high-tech didn't exist back, back then. Science-based industry. And moreover, uh, the, uh, the idea was to uh, support financially commercial R&D, that the government will step in, okay, and, and do that. That was, at the time, a revolutionary idea. Worldwide. Because governments were supporting R&D ever since well, in history for a long time, but in the way we know it, since Vannevar Bush wrote, you know, Science, the Endless Frontier, 1945, okay, it was clear that the government has a role, okay, uh, but the way it was envisioned is that the government was going to support big missions, health and, and defense uh, and so forth, but not to, through matching grants for commercial uh, R&D. Now, there were two uh, decisions taken at the time that proved to be really prescient and, and, and revolutionary. One was neutrality. Neutrality meaning that the government doesn't say, hey, we are going to develop this or that technology or this or that field. No, the market comes to us, the innovators come to us, okay, we screen the proposals according to certain criteria and support it. We don't decide what's going to be invented. And that notion of, of neutrality has, has accompanied us throughout, and it's one of the reasons we are successful is with, because we stuck to that and we let the market speak rather than you know, officials in Jerusalem or in Tel Aviv uh, doing that. And the second thing is that you have to understand when you want to support innovation, you have to be innovative yourself. You cannot be rigid, you cannot establish a convoluted set of bureaucratic rules because you know, the market is going to run faster than you can start to consider to change the rules and adapt to a changing world. And so you know, these two elements, okay, the dynamism in the policy and the neutrality were crucial for uh, what happened later on. The, the, the programs that were enacted, the matching grants, by the way, this matching grants program is now commonplace the world over. And in many countries, they learn from the Israeli experience because we were pioneers in that sense already in the 70s. So in the 90s and in, in 2000 and so forth, many, many countries entered the fray and uh, uh, kind of adopted very similar policies. Support for generic R&D consortia, this was mentioned uh, uh, yesterday. It, it exists in, in many other countries. One-to-one uh, -one industry academic uh, collaborations. I'm not going to dwell on this. You know, this is uh, easy to follow 
from other sources. What I want to impress you is that there is a variety of uh, means of supporting uh, R&D. Uh, and by the way, you know, lots of programs, not that much money. And believe me that as much as I, you know, I'm used to come to the government and, and ask for more budget for higher education and research and so forth, I'm very mindful that oftentimes we put too much emphasis on money and not so much on how we do things and how we deploy uh, those budgets. Now, let me now sound a different note. Yes, we have been incredibly successful in innovation. Yes, we had rates of growth, uh, sustained rates of growth of about four, five percent during many years uh, because of that. But this is not panacea. There hasn't been trickle down in Israel because of growth, of, of, of innovation. Rather, innovation has been concentrated in a relatively small sector of the economy and society, which we call high tech, which hasn't grown in terms of number of employees and people that benefit from it. And rather than lifting all the boats, socioeconomic disparities in Israel have increased over those years, not only because of this, but also because of the tremendous success of a, of a very small sector. And so it's a mixed experience for us. And one has to tell the truth and not, you know, just say, hey, you look, you know, we are the, the startup nation, great. The question is what happens to the average citizen in Israel? Why it hasn't trickled down? For many reasons, some of them are listed here. We all, virtually all of our innovations are export oriented, good for the balance of payment. But if you just export them and you don't target also the needs of the local market, the benefits from those innovations are going to go to foreign consumers. Good for them and good for the pockets of the innovators that conceive those, but not for Israeli society at large. We are very proud of the fact that there are over 200 multinationals uh, doing R&D in Israel. Good for them. You know, I, you know, just to give you an example, Intel has not only FAPS, but they have a huge lab in Israel. The Centrino processor that revolutionized the laptops was developed in Israel. So what came out from that for Israelis? The salaries of those that develop it. Great. How many were they? A hundred? So you have to, you know, I, I, I'm saying things in a very pointed way, but just realize that not the chance, not all the chance is gold. And, and, and same with the VC backed uh, uh, startups. So the issue, the real challenge that is open to us is how to turn this startup nation into uh, a nation, a startup nation for all, into a, an economy and a society where most people can benefit from the tremendous energies that go into innovation and not be content just to point out at the rate of growth of the economy at large and at the number of patents and so forth and so on. Again, the question is what's happening to the average Israeli as a consequence uh, of that. Now, let me go now to the, to the last point here, the ecosystem for innovation and some lessons that I, can, that I would like to draw. First of all, um, you know, mirroring the issues that they raised before, you know, when you ask yourself, what should I do if I want to uh, 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 go big time uh, into innovation mode? Well, this is all obvious. The question is, what are the contents? And are we going to that? You have to release the entrepreneurial genie. You have to provide with some key economic ingredients and to uh, go for an uh, innovative university. But, but what's the content of that? So first of all, 
in terms of the entrepreneurial gene. And here, you know, again, it's one of these issues that they're very hard to, to pin down, but I want to take a shot at it because I, I think it's perhaps the most important one and the one that we least discuss because it's so hard. And what you essentially what you need is institutions that really know how to bring the best and the brightest and provide them with incentives to innovate rather than speculating in Wall Street or you know, going into the other occupations uh, that don't lead to innovations but to rent redistribution. There's a huge difference between rent creation and rent redistribution. And unfortunately, too much talent is diverted towards rent redistribution and not towards rent creation. That doesn't happen in automatic mode. You have to pay attention to that. Somebody, some institutions, have to do it. Otherwise, it doesn't happen uh, uh, by, by itself. You need social norms that are conducive to change. Innovation is change. Innovation means that you do things differently. But then the worst enemy of innovation is the, the status quo. It's thinking that your mission in life is to keep it from moving, you know, this podium, because it may tilt, okay? No, if you want to innovate, you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with the way this hall is organized? Okay, maybe I should distribute the, the, you know, the, the tables in a different way. You have to constantly challenge what you see around yourself. These are social norms. And it's not easy to change norms, but you have to aim at that if you truly want this uh, to happen. And these demographics, uh, you know, most innovators are young. As much as I want, I would like to think of myself as a potential innovator in many areas, uh, I have to recognize that the color of my hair is quite an indication of my potential. Um, so let me say something else about this. You know, Canada is quite an extraordinary case of a country that has reached a place, and, and you mentioned that yesterday, um, of really of envy for the rest of the world in terms of quality of living. You know, all the indices of human, um, a, what's it called, the human development index and quality of life. Canada is either number one or number two. And you have done that in spite of the fact that you border with the US, which is not small achievement. <laughs> and you have done that because you managed to find a formula that is very elusive, that you maintain the fundamentals of a market economy and at the same time, you avoid the excesses, excesses of capitalism. And that's essentially the main challenge in the economic and social arena that we face. And you have done it, focusing on other aspects of human development and not just on GDP. And that's a great achievement. But let me tell you the following. That's also, a, there is, danger in that, danger of being complacent, danger of saying, hey, if we are there, let's keep it as it is and avoid change. But you cannot hold the stick from both sides. You want innovation, you have to revere change. And, but then you may ask, but you know, if you have it so good, you know, why change? Well, you know, uh, Nothing lasts forever. And you have to all the time ask yourself in this changing world, what should I do different in order to preserve what I have achieved, the basic values I have achieved? Let me give you an example. What happened last week here in the parliament? So, you know, with the shooting, shocking. 
I see that as a great opportunity for innovation. What do you mean? Well, the challenge is how to produce a system of security that will not interfere with the basic values of this country, among others, the openness. Okay? That's a challenge. Don't think about it as a bureaucratic issue that some committee has to change and you know, tamper with the rules so as to make sure that you know, the, this and that happens. Take it as a challenge for change, maintaining the basic values. And you can do it in many areas, but it's a different approach that you need. So, you know, I, I will recommend that you pay attention to this slide, even though it's the least academic. We know the least about it, okay? And I cannot show you graphs of upper sopling, sloping curves about that. Now, with the innovative university. You know, the universities, of course, the main mission is, as, is research and training the elites of academic research for the future. But it's clear that we live in an era where there is a multiplicity of roles that are expected from us regardless of what you think. Okay, and they include that we, indeed, that we innovate, that we, you talk about, you know, being powerhouses for growth. Yes, you know, this is what we are expected to do as part of our main mission, not a sidekick, okay? We should train the labor force for a dynamic labor market. Do we do it, really? Do we engage in lifelong learning, aside from the slogans that we are so eager to repeat? Not quite. We are expected to also do mission-oriented research. You have a problem, there is an energy crisis, there is climate change, there is water scarcity. You go to the universities, you expect them to respond to those uh, challenges. And we expect the universities to be a vehicle of social mobility. It's not easy to deliver on these missions because some of them are conflicting, okay? And it's a matter of culture and emphasis uh, and, and so forth. That's the context. When you say innovations, what's the role of, inno of universities in inno innovation? Put that in context, in the context of a multiplicity of dimensions that universities are expected to perform. Can we do it? Well, it's really difficult because the costs that are escalating, we all know that, you know, the, the, the global competition is really unbelievable, and what people don't understand is that talent, true talent, is scarce, is going to be scarce forever. And it doesn't matter how many billions of dollars are thrown into that, talent is going to be scarce. And so when the global competition intensifies for talent, what happens is it's an escalation of costs, and not much more than that. Okay? And we are facing that big time. And there are, of course, conflicting pressures uh, on us that impinge on our ability to come to the government and say, hey, you know, we need, as I said before, more budgets. Okay? So, yes, but what are you going exactly to do given the multiplicity of missions? No, no, give me the money I know best. You know, that's kind of the typical answer. But, you know, it's for some reason it doesn't get traction, that answer. <laughs> and we have to recognize that universities are rather conservative institutions, with good reason. You know, it's a model that has lasted for a thousand years. Not exactly the same, but, you know, it's, it's, it's there. And we don't want to tamper with it too much. But, hey, guys, you know, the world is changing. And if we stick to the that conservatism, okay, we are not going to be able to meet the challenges. We have to recognize that the governance of universities, you know, they are problematic, to say the least. And it's a, there is this problem that, you know, if each one of us has one goal, to be the next Harvard, the result, and sorry to say, 
is that all of us were going to be mediocre. Because by definition, we cannot all be Harvard. So, you know, these are things that I don't say them uh, with reproach. I say them with being mindful that these are difficult issues, but we have to confront them and not be complacent about them. So what to do? Well, first and foremost, we need to diversify our reward system. In most universities, in most countries, there's only one scale. Count the number of publications, you know, weighted by citations if you are more sophisticated, and that's it, you know? And all the rest really doesn't matter for promotion. You, you, do you think that, yes, that's incredibly important, the first mission, but do you think that you can achieve results in the other dimensions if there is a one uh, uh, dimension of rewards and promotions for all, that doesn't work. Okay, so we think that without damaging, without affecting the, the scientific scale. Um, collaborations, you have spoken a lot about collaborations in the past two days. But let me say, you know, one way of to discuss collaboration is, yeah, you know, we should do it. Um, it it's nice to have. It's also nice to put on a slide and present in a different country. It looks great. <laughs> Particularly if you put the flags, you know, I like flags. But, you know, collaborations in my mind, it's a must. And the reason is that most institutions, if not all, cannot be self-sufficient. And you need to prioritize, and you need to recognize that more than ever, uh, research is not the work of a genius sitting in his or her office and saying, Eureka, okay? But rather, you know, each letter in Eureka is, is produced by the different scientist. So it's a must, and it's also a way to avoid mediocrity, because then, you know, when you have weaknesses, you compensate by uh, 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 linking to others uh, and so forth. We talked yesterday about lowering the disciplinary barriers. Uh, you heard the Professor Clafters speaking about that in Tel Aviv. This is, that's essential. The structure of universities this day in terms of faculties and departments has become, have become an obstacle to true academic and scientific uh, uh, progress. Um, and we have to reach out. You know, when I think, when I say reach out, I don't mean, okay, let's hire a VP for public relations and, you know, put more stuff in the internet. You have to reach out because believe me that the public out there and the government officials, they are not like-minded with you in the sense of, wow, you publish in nature, you're a genius, come, you know, and you open the paycheck. It doesn't work that way. I'm day in and day out there. What is kind of obvious for you is not at all clear for others. And given, again, the escalating costs and the increasing importance of our emissions for society and the economy, we have to reach out as a main motive in our behavior. Not as, again, as a kind of, oh my God, you know, another VP, you know, that sort of thing. So these are some of the, um, uh, of the what to do. Let me conclude um, uh, by saying that, you know, um, innovation is important. It's very hard to pin down. There is not a silver bullet. It's an attitude more than anything else. And again, you know, uh, uh, complacency is dangerous. Arrogance is even more dangerous. And I'm speaking, you know, of each of, of people that we know, let's put it that way. Um, you know, I was born in Argentina and my wife was born in Canada. Not exactly the same time, you know, I'm a bit older, but give or take mid-century. I'm not ready to reveal more than that. Um, Argentina and Canada 
had almost exactly the same data at the beginning of the 20th century. And they were, the two of them, considered to be the most promising countries outside, you know, the U.S. and so forth. I mean, outside the very, the, those countries that already made it, okay, they were widely considered. They had similar similarities in many ways, resources, agriculture, um, Canada is much larger than Argentina in terms of land mass, but the useful land mass is not very different, okay, and so forth. <coughs> European populations, not indigenous for the most part, you name it. A bit beautiful cities, okay, Buenos Aires was at the time, so I'm told. And then you look at the time that I was born and my wife was born, Argentina was already a third world country. And Canada was very much a first world country. And they, they have diverged ever more since. And you look again and you say, hey, you know, what the hell happened here? You know, the size of the population is more or less the same these days. 35 million, 36 million, give or take, okay? Natural resources, there are plenty in both places. Equally important, you may not know, but Argentina has huge reserves of potential oil, except that Canada is doing it and Argentina is sitting on it, okay? And you ask yourself, you know, what the hell happened here? You know, and between my wife and I, we span the continent. Perhaps that's the reason we live elsewhere. And what happened is, essentially, that the people behave very differently. And that's it. You know, the people, you know, you can, you say the governments, come on, you know, somehow they come from somewhere. They behave differently in fundamental ways, in terms of values, in terms of codes or code of behavior, in terms of good government in the sense of the institutions of government, not the who sits where. In terms of tolerance, towards multicultures and so forth, and also in terms of change, because Canada is now very happy with its present predicament, but there was a great deal of change in the intervening years, and people were not afraid of change. So what I'm saying is, in order to preserve your place, hard work and well-deserved, okay, don't look at today, look at tomorrow, and what it takes to keep the, 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 the ranking, if you wish, the values in a completely different environment. Thank you very much.